Welcome to the Commerce Lab, where every week we sit down with top performing consumer brands and leaders to understand what drives their success. How did they hit their first million, the first 20 million, the first 100 million? What strategies are working for them today that you should be testing and what's not working that you should be avoiding? This isn't just a podcast. It's the business school for brand operators. Hey crew, this is Alan Burton. Welcome back to another episode of the Commerce Lab. And today I've got an awesome guest on by the name of Patrick Kadu of Supply. And if you've heard the name Supply or if you've heard the name Patrick Kadu, I'm not surprised. These guys have had an absolutely banner last 12 months. Supply is essentially a high-end manufacturer of men's razor blades. Like think of it like it's almost like the fighter jet of razor blades and shaving equipment. And over the last 12 months, these guys have hit their first seven figures in yearly revenue in 2018. Uh, They landed on Shark Tank and they hit their first seven figure month this last November of 2019. So to say they've had some spectacular growth of last year would be an understatement. And there's a few very specific things that Patrick and his team have done at Supply over the last 12 months that caught my attention. And it's the reason why I wanted to have him on the show to break down in the hopes that we could sort of dissect his philosophies and strategies for why he made these decisions and how he made these accomplishments so that you can apply them to your own businesses and brands. So the first is he made a major move this year uh, in around October of 2019. Uh, to move all of his fulfillment over to the Shopify Fulfillment Network. And if you've seen this announcement, Shopify and Not launched their brand new fulfillment network uh, at the Unite conference this year. And he's been one of the first beta customers to test and use the Shopify Fulfillment Network. So we break down exactly why he made that move and why he's betting his operations specifically on Shopify now and also in the future. Second, we talk about his seven figure month, you know, a huge milestone for any brand is to see seven figures in revenue in a single month. So we break down what, you know, what did Patrick and his team do to actually hit this goal? Right. Um, And what's sort of the, the sort of flywheel effect of various different tactics and strategies that they've been implementing over the last four years to get them up to this point. So we break down what all of those are. And then finally, Patrick and his team made a decision to remove all of their products off of Amazon, even though Amazon was contributing about 20% of their total sales you know, per volume. So why did he make that decision? And what's his philosophy around why buyers buy from Amazon versus buying from a branded site? And why did that affect his decision to pull products from Amazon in the hopes that that would actually help him achieve greater brand equity over the long term with his brand supply? So we break down all of these uh, in our conversation. So without further ado, I'll leave it up to Patrick Kadu of Supply Deco. Hey, Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Alan. So I'm I'm really excited about this one. We've got a ton of hit points we're gonna we're gonna touch on, but just to give everybody a little bit of context before we get started, can you give us just a quick you know, quick intro who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name is Patrick Kadu. I founded a company called Supply, and we sell men's premium shaving and grooming products. Uh, our flagship product is a solid stainless steel single blade razor. And kind of the value prop for it is that it uh, gives a smooth, close and comfortable shave, but without uh, ingrown hairs and irritation that multi-blade razors can cause for a large percentage of men, uh, myself included. So we, we launched our company in 2015. My wife and I were bootstrapped. We're a small team, five of us, and, uh, but we're growing quickly and trying to change the world one razor at a time. So in, you guys have had a, a killer year, um, including November being a, I think, I think it was your first seven figure month. I think you said, yes. um, and so we're going to, we're going to dive into that and kind of talk about, you know, you know, how and why and sort of the levers that have been the most helpful into to getting where you are. But I think just to give just some, some brief background and just so people kind of understand a little bit of the backstory, um, why razors, you know, why did you guys start with razors and, and what was your bra- you know, your background prior to starting this business? <laughs> I'm smiling because I asked myself a lot of time the same question. Why razors? Why did I start with razors? It's not uh, competitive. It's not competitive at all, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not competitive. It's a very difficult product. I've had people 
kind of dunk on me and talk like it's an easy product to make. It's, it's not at all. It's an extremely difficult product to make. Um, so, but why razors? I, I designed and, um, I basically invented our product as a, it was kind of a personal frustration. Uh, so I cannot use multi-blade razors. They destroy my face. You know, I get the razor bumps, I get the irritation, I get the burn, I get all, all of that stuff. And so long story short, I spent years literally, and I'm trying to solve this problem by using different razors. I went as far as I started a blog with a friend of mine that reviewed razors online. Um, it became like the top Google search for razor reviews. Um, and then I fell down this rabbit hole of this style, old school style of shave and the way our grandfather shaved using a single blade. And, um, it, it requires a little more um, investment up front in the handle and it requires a little more learning up front and how to use the product. But once you get over those two humps, it's much more affordable in the long run and it's much better for your skin and, and for the planet by reducing waste. So um, it's really a personal problem that I spent years trying to solve and, and turned it into a business. And you just couldn't find anything out there that, that did it as well as, as you wanted to be done? No. Uh, yeah. Um, so our, our razor is a reinvention of actually an old style of razor that was invented by Schick in the early, early 1900s. But the, 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 that particular product I found an old vintage version of, and I fell in love with, uh, you can like find these old razors on eBay and kind of recondition them and use them yourself. Uh, but they don't make those anymore. So they stopped making them in like the nineties because surprise, they can make a lot more money off of multi mm -hmm. razors. Right. Um, so I, I kind of took it as a personal challenge of like, I finally found something that works for me, but it doesn't like, it doesn't exist anymore. So I kind of designed it myself so that I could share it with friends and family and, and make, make a few of them and move on with my life. And, and it uh, kind of blew up and turned into a real business. And how many years ago was this? We launched on Kickstarter in August of 2015. So, okay. it's been so a you guys, over you guys years. were on Kickstarter. I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, okay. actually, uh, so we've done three campaigns. Um, Have you really? Yeah. So is that, is that been all for three different products? Uh, the first one was for the razor. The second one was for version two of the razor. So okay. 2.0 is what we call it. And then uh, we did 80K, I think, on the first campaign. We did almost 300 on the second campaign. And then the third campaign was like this kind of nothing burger campaign. We, we launched a doc kit that I'm, I'm very proud of, but it was like 30 K or something, nothing. Gotcha. Nothing okay. And so was the idea behind this? Cause I know, like you've mentioned, you know, bootstrapped. Um, so then Kickstarter funds really is what, uh, you know, what Kickstarter production, right? So did you guys use the funds from Kickstarter to start production and then just your own investment dollars to, to fund marketing and, and the team? Yeah, hundred percent. So without yeah. Kickstarter, we would, we would not exist at all. Right. Um, I've, I've put a ton of my own money into it, but I needed much more. And, and, and that much I got from Kickstarter. And so, you know, over the last, and so, and I'm not, we don't have to dig into, you know, precise revenue numbers, but I know you guys sure. are, you know, into the seven figures now. Um, and how long did it take you guys from that initial Kickstarter campaign to hit your first sort of seven figure year? Yeah. And I don't mind sharing numbers because it's all on national TV now, but, um, <laughs> it took about, <laughs> it took about three years. I got over that real fast. You know, when I, when we went on TV and shared our sales numbers, it's all public now, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what does it matter? Um, so, uh, last year was our first, um, seven figure year. So we did like just a hair over a million dollars last year. Um, okay. So that was 2018 and launched in 2015. And we basically have doubled every year. We did half a million the year before we did about 250 the year before. And okay. um, so like we've kind of doubled every year and, and this year we'll do close to, to $3 million. Awesome. With November being a seven figure month. That's correct. So we did more yeah. revenue in November this year than we did all of last year. Okay. So that's, that's what I want to, I want to dig into because obviously that's, that's an incredible milestone, right? So first off hitting a million is a, is a, in a year is a great milestone, but hitting a million a month is a fantastic milestone. Obviously it's November. So you've got some, some of the, yeah. you know, the winds at your back, uh, of the holidays. Um, and I know you guys also had uh, a recent, uh, you know, shark tank, you know, airing yep. that was also, I think leading up to that, but would love to, to dig in a little bit on, I think we can sort of tie this together talking about sort of the first seven figure year, then leading into your first seven figure month. Uh, what I really like to do when I talk to brand owners and founders like you is that, look, 
everybody is throwing tons of stuff at the wall trying to see what sticks in the early days. And the reality is that most of it fails, right? Most yeah. of the stuff doesn't work. Most of the stuff costs you money. Most of the stuff, um, you know, ends up, you know, kind of getting tossed to the side. Yeah. And so what I'd like to do is try to figure out for you specifically and for your brand, what have you seen be the most effective you know, when you kind of look back, what were those biggest levers that had the largest impact for you hitting that first seven figure year and then hitting that seven figure month? Yeah, I, I really like how you said, you know, you throw stuff against the wall and see what works and see what doesn't. And I, I, I struggle with the question of what's, what's been your biggest lever um, because that, like, that's what I've been searching for for years. And I know that's right. what a lot of other young entrepreneurs are searching for is like, what's, yeah. the, what's the golden bullet or, you know, the, yeah. the one thing I need to do to 10x my business. And like, as far as I'm aware, that doesn't exist. And so Fair. for us, yep. for us, it's been it's been a lot of small things kind of slowly building over time to, to finally like start working together. So, you know, I'll give you examples of what, you know, what works for us. We, we do a lot of paid marketing. So we do a lot of Facebook, Instagram. Um, and, and that does well for us. We wouldn't do it if we weren't making money or at least breaking even, um, on Facebook. Um, so that has been a key lever of our growth. Um, I want it to not be a key lever of our growth in the future, but it kind of is what it is right now. You, you gotta, you gotta get your name out there somehow. And that's kind of the easiest, quickest way to do it. Um, we've done YouTube marketing in the past. It's done very well for us. Um, we're not doing it right now because, um, we kind of switched teams, uh, but I hope to ramp that up again in the future. So those are like the big levers, paid marketing, you know, no big surprise there. But um, but what has really kind of come to, what I'm really starting four or five years in to kind of see the fruits of my efforts are, are just all the small things. Um, and so I'll give you an example. Like right now, if you go search our brand name, Supply, or you search Supply Razor, um, you know, which is what most of our prospects are going to do. Um, you'll see, we, we now have the number one spot for the word supply, which has taken me four years to get. If you Google supply, that's, we're at the top. Um, every single thing you see on the front page of Google, if you Google supply razor, is just praise about our product. So there's YouTubers that have reviewed our product. There's Reddit threads, you know, there's blogs about our product. And like, some of those are from two years ago, you know, and the, it's just been like, um, and the point of what I'm getting at is like, when you Google my, my product and see all that, like that's four years of work that I've done mm -hmm. in, into right. sending people products and following up with them and, um, getting people to write about us and, um, you know, just so on and so on and so on that, um, and, and working on the SEO on the website and, uh, setting up an affiliate program. Like we have an affiliate program that pays 15%, which is, which is pretty dang good as far as affiliate programs go. And, um, so, so all these small things of just like putting one foot in front of another, reaching out to press, reaching out to influencers, reaching out to affiliates and just getting my name out there any way I can think. And as cheap as I can think, um, is really, we're, we're fine. Like it didn't, the whole point of this, and I'll, I'll kind of quit talking. The whole point of this is like, it didn't feel like I was getting anywhere for three years. Right. And like, it's finally like my plan is finally coming together, you know, like kind of four years later. So it takes time and there's no silver bullet is kind of, kind of my message. But, um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. No, it's uh, incredibly but, helpful. Cause I think it's the, in the, the visual I always like to talk about is the flywheel, right? Like mm -hmm. a flywheel takes so much effort, right. Yeah. To get running and moving. But once you get moving, you have all that momentum and the momentum continues to propel you forward. Right. Yeah. So it's what your point is that for you guys, you know, it sounds like if you had to, if you looked at, you know, analytics and you actually tracked your, you know, your, your highest sort of return on investment, you'd probably say it's paid marketing or your largest sort yeah. of contributor sales is, is paid performance ad spend. Yeah. But reality, right. It's, you know, that alone wouldn't get you to where you're at. There's a ton of these little tiny things that you've been doing over the last four years that have built in this flywheel that have just propelled the momentum to make that ad spend much more effective. Yeah. And I, I will say, um, if, if I had to pick a big lever out of that big kind of mess of things I've talked about, it would be, um, it would be the fact that I put my name on my product and I came to work every single day, putting my name on the emails I send to my customers, to my affiliates, to my influencers. And like people know that 
I associate my name with my product and like they, they, um, and when I say people, I mean everything from prospects to customers to, uh, my partners that I work with. Um, and the, this isn't a talk about me. The, the, the point is not about me, but the point is like, I, I always love to encourage, um, entrepreneurs that are just a few steps behind me to like take pride in your products and put your name on them. And like people believe in people, they don't believe in razors. And, um, as much as you can put your name and your face on what you're doing, like it it will only help you. It, 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 you will see the dividends of that over time. Um, so I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's the biggest, um, thing that I've seen in, in our business is like, I can't tell you how many emails I get from customers of like, I bought this product because I believed in you. And like, I didn't really I need a that. razor, but I, right. I believed in you and your mission. And oh, by the way, I love this razor and now I'll never buy another one. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, in the early stage for brands in the early stage, there's a lot of hesi- you know, hesitation to put your name on the brand yeah. or to associate the brand too much for yourselves because then it's connected to you, right? And yeah, if, and you know, I get that, yeah. Right. And, but it's, and it's the end of the day, like most founders eventually want an exit, right? They want to sell their yeah. business. Mm-hmm. Most founders do, if we're all being honest, right? And, and there's always that sort of hesitation to say, well, if this is too tied to me, you know, is this really an yeah. asset that can roll down the road? And the reality is that it, most brands, right? As you, as you get big enough, you can de- decouple yourself yeah. from the 100%. brand itself. The brand develops its own momentum, but it's really difficult to do that in the early days when nobody knows who that brand is or what you stand yeah. for. And so having a personality and typically is the founder's personality is the, the best way to get that, that early traction. But I, I hear that all the time. Brands are like, I don't want to be on the site. I don't want my name on the site. I, you know, it's, it, it, I want that, to decouple myself from the brand. Uh, that's a mistake as far as I'm concerned. And I know that thought I would agree. process because I went through that for the first year plus of my brand. Like I was not on the website. I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't know if it was going to be, what if this fails? And then my name right. you know, tied yep. to that. Um, yep. and, and the other thing is like, yeah, I don't want to be the face like of my brand when I'm a $20 million brand. Hopefully that's in the future. But like the reality is there aren't a lot of people that are going to buy a $1 million brand, you know, that's doing maybe 10% right. EBITDA. So right. like, forget the future, like focus on right now, what you can do to be the best small business you can be. And then like figure out the rest later. You know, it, it doesn't scale writing handwritten notes to customers, but forget about what scales, like do what works right now. And then you can figure out how and if to scale it in the future. So kind of talking about the scaling piece, I think that's a good pivot is you, know, you mentioned you have five team members. What's, what's the makeup of the team? How have you allocated your team and, and resources, um, you know, at the stage you're at right now? Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I don't know if it's an embarrassing answer or an unimpressive answer, but, uh, it's my wife and I are the co-founders. Um, I do all the operations, uh, supply chain strategy, um, uh, marketing side, kind of paid marketing side. Uh, Jennifer does all the social media. She does all of our email marketing. She does, um, she's kind of over customer service. Um, and then, um, she also does all of our content marketing as well. So blogs and that kind of thing. Um, and then the rest, we have three, uh, part-time employees, you know, that are basically fresh out of college, um, that just, do all the grunt work and, um, just kind of go to battle every day. So lately the the past six weeks, it's been like, they're all just doing customer service emails. And so their, their roles kind of change based on what I need. Gotcha. Kind of um, what's going on. Yeah. But, um, I I really need to make a new hire as, as, as we kind of grow, um, our biggest challenge is, uh, supply chain and operations and and product development. And so my next big hire will be a, uh, kind of director of operations and and product development. So, uh, that, that'll be kind of my first huge hire. And so, and actually I want to talk a little bit about sort of how you think about product development in the space you're in here in in just a second, before we get that, I want to, I want to kind of close the loop on, on the marketing and levers piece. Mm -hmm. How how do you think about, cause I, I tend to find this falls into line with this conversation of, you know, how you hire and who you hire. How do you think about allocation of marketing, right? So obviously paid spend is a big piece of what you guys do, Mm -hmm. but uh, some founders kind of shoot from the hip in terms of, you know, how they, how they allocate spend and they kind of adjust it throughout the year. Do you have a sort of a methodology or sort of a certain percentage or a way that you think about, okay, we're allocating specifically, you know, 15% to paid spend and we're allocating, you know, another 5% to, um, you know, know, influencer campaigns, right? Do you guys have like a formula for how you guys think about allocation of, of resources for marketing? 
I don't have a formula. Um, the way I think about paid is I'm willing to put a dollar anywhere where I can get two or more back. Um, and so I have channels where I know that that formula works and I'm going to push as hard as I can on that formula as long as I can. So, you know, Facebook, yep. Instagram, Google. Um, and then while those are working, I'm going to test other things in a, in a way where um, uh, I know I can burn that money and, and like, be okay with myself if I don't get any of that back. So I've burned money on Pinterest, you know, and like mm -hmm. I saw nothing come back from that basically. And so, um, and we'll be testing new marketing channels in the future. We're going to test influencer marketing, um, next year. And, um, uh, it's completely escaped me, but I have, <laughs> I thought I had some other plans. I can't remember them right now, but, um, <laughs> basically the way I look at it is like, I've got kind of steady state marketing, yep. um, that's working. And then what can I do to diversify beyond that and test new channels? And, and like, how much money do I think I need to set aside to test those? And, and for us, I don't, I don't know how it is for other people, but for us, it's like, I put five grand towards a new channel, see how it feels. Um, if it doesn't work like Pinterest doesn't, you know, I, I shut it off and go test something else. And how do you think about sort of managing, you know, EBITDA and profitability, you know, as compared to scale, right? And so just yeah. as an example, I was having a conversation literally yesterday of two very different brands, um, you know, one of which is, you know, focusing on, you know, maintaining a, as close to a, you know, 15 to 20% you know, profit margin as they can. And another yeah. brand that literally is, is specifically dialed in and optimized at the end of the year, there is zero profit left. Right. <laughs> and everything goes, <clears throat> everything goes into marketing. Right. And yeah. if they have a profit, they consider that a failure because they could have grown more if they had, you know, if they'd reinvested it. So I'm curious yeah. how you think about, especially as a boost, you know, bootstrap yeah. founder, who's running, you know, who has a family, right. And children, you yeah. know, and you know, now you've raised a little bit of capital through, through Shark Tank, but how yeah. do you think about how you optimize your, you know, your profit margins versus your ability, you know, versus the trajectory, trajectory of scale that you want to achieve? Yeah, it's really funny you ask that because I think about that a lot and it's a really hard and, and important question to ask yourself. And so my my and my philosophy kind of changes every year. This year it's been I wanted to press on growth as hard as I can at basically break even profitability. And that's basically where where we were prior to Shark Tank appearance um, this year. And so next year actually I'm I'm literally right now in the middle of okay, where do I want to be next year? Do I want to do 10 million break even or or do I want to do like six with, you know, 10, 15% uh, EBITDA? So I, I honestly don't know the answer right now, but I'll, I'll tell you, we, we, uh, we finally have a little bit of money in our pockets and, and it feels good. Um, because now I can start thinking more about like, where can I start testing and kind of feeling out not only marketing channels, but new product development and investing in inventory and, um, so, so anyways, I, I'm kind of going through this, um, evolve thought of process, um, uh, evolve thinking lately where like it, it feels so good to have cash in the bank so that I can invest in inventory and other things that like, I kind of want to keep that feeling going. So I, I may change my strategy from pushing for break even growth to, okay, let's pull back a little bit and let's, let's kind of have a little bit more money in, in, in the pocket so that we can we can do things right and hire people and, and invest in inventory. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's no, it does. It does. I it's, it. you know, I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think it's, it's more of a, a personal preference and, and sort of, you know, optimizing for growth or profitability. And, yeah. you know, there, there has to be a balance between the two. And I think when you're bootstrapped or, or you've raised a little bit of, uh, of investor cash, but you still, you know, you still control the business. You have the ability to make that decision, right? Where a lot of brands don't. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was curious specifically given how you've grown the company, the way that you, you looked at that and how you, how you make decisions. Yeah. Um, let's talk about product because one thing that I love about you guys is I just, and I think I just have a personal obsession with this type of a product, a, a product that has a, you know, high AOV, um, meaning that, you know, your ability, you know, you have the ability to be profitable on ad spend on the first purchase, right? But still maintains recurring revenue on the back end, um, whether it be through subscriptions or you know continual repurchases of things like razor blades, right? So to me, in in the way that I I think of sort of like the perfect sort of product setup, 
um, you guys kind of fall into that range because of what you guys have built. So I'd be very curious to kind of think through, you know, when you were developing the model, you know, was this intentional? Were you like, hey, look, this is something that we're going to be able to sell at a high price point. It's going to be able to be profitable on first, first purchase. And then we're also going to be able to capture a lot of that post-purchase revenue through either kind of upsells into things like, you know, you know, face bombs or creams, but mainly through additional razors over the lifetime of the customer. It's funny. I'm, I'm laughing over here because none of you're absolutely right. And I just fell into it. It was all a big accident. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, um, I had zero sense of what it meant to run an online, um, direct to consumer business before I started. Um, and I, I just, I, I know nobody, I don't know anybody who's done this before. I, I have, I had zero connection to, to any other community. And so like, I was just making this up as I go. I, I remember, you know, you know, trying to figure out how much do you even charge for products, you know, based on what they cost you, you know, to make. And, um, so I've, I've had to learn kind of hard, hard ways a lot that, uh, you know, where our gross margins need to be. So, um, you know, to, to me, you know, uh, gross margin has been something I've been hammering on for the past kind of 12 months. And for me, like it needs to be kind of 60 plus, um, for us to scale. Um, and anyways, but back to your question, uh, we just kind of fell into this great, um, and, and I don't want to talk about myself, but kind of tell people how, how successful this is so that they can maybe think about, um, setting their business up this way, but we've got this great flagship product, um, that is very, it's a commodity product, but it's elevated and it's very different from our competition. So clearly from day one, we're set apart when people see our product, Oh, there's something different. It's a razor, but it's different. Um, and then, so we use that product as a, uh, kind of Trojan horse into a guy's bathroom. Okay. So he, 99% of customers, first thing they purchase from us is our razor. And then that's kind of our acquisition tool to where we can bring them into the family and then begin offering them all of our additional, uh, products, including obviously razor blades, which are consumable, but that's kind of how we view it is like, we've got this high margin, high AOV product that brings them in profitably, or at least break even at first. And then now we've got them in the, in the family. So let's sell them all of our other great, they fall in love with a razor that they use every single day, of course, they're going to want to buy my other products. And, um, so we've got, you know, the face wash, we got the shaving cream, we got aftershave, we got, we got all the things. And that's our goal for 2020 is to continue to build out this product line of additional cool. products that work, you know, in, in conjunction with this flagship product. That was gonna be my next question was, you know, how much are sort of, you know, product line extensions, you know, a big piece of, of the go forward plan. Yeah, they're a huge part of our strategy because, like I said, for for as far as I can see in the future, the razor will continue to be our acquisition tool. But but from day one, we've never wanted to be a razor brand, and that's why people are really confused about our name. Like, why would you call a razor company supply? And uh, like it was it was meant to be generic from the beginning. Um, so that like, we wouldn't just be a razor brand. Like we want to be a full, um, kind of one-stop shop for men's grooming supplies. And, um, so, so that, that's a big part of our plan going forward is to kind of continue to build out this ecosystem. And so we were, we were kind of talking about flywheel effects, you know, before, and one of the things I love about subscription, you know, subscription revenue businesses, right. Is that it does act like a flywheel and it takes a long time to see substantial revenue coming from subscription, especially yeah. when it's a lower price point subscription product. But once it does, man, it's really powerful. Right. And I'd be curious to, to know kind of where you guys are at right now. Do you feel like the subscription and, and, actually, and I'm, I'm making an assumption, do you guys offer the razor as a subscription? Like it's funny. We, we do not, um, uh, okay. we met, we wanted to launch, we were going to launch it in October. Uh, but you know, we aired on shark tank November 3rd and we just never, we never got around to it. So we're going to launch it probably in January. Okay. Well then we'll, we'll sort of same, same concept, but yeah. do you, do you see a, uh, maybe I'll ask this a little bit differently. The blade, like the re, uh, the repurchase, right? The blade repurchases, right? For folks that already own the razor, you know, yeah. how much of that is contributing to overall revenue? And you don't have to give exact numbers, but I'm just curious, yeah. like, is it substantial or is it still a pretty small amount? And do you feel like there's just a ton of opportunity as that continues to expand and as you launch subscription you know, with it? Um, 
So the way I think about blades is it's a very, we, the, one of the value propositions of our product is blades are so cheap. So you can buy, we sell a pack of eight blades for six bucks and that lasts about three months. So okay. do the math. I'm not making a ton of money off of right. blades and I've never really viewed it as like, we're kind of the opposite of the Gillette and the Dollar Shave Club model, Got it. That, the razors and blades model. But the way I view it is like, that's a value proposition that now our customers are like, I don't have to pay a lot for blades. And um, and that's a good thing. And now I'm committed to this brand because of that. And we kind of make it up the way we look at it is we make it up on, on the other products that we sell. Got it. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. Cause I want to, and this was you know the original reason why I reached out and wanted to talk to you. Um, I want to talk about fulfillment because I know that you guys have within the last you know few months, couple months, made a switch over to Shopify's new fulfillment network, which is a, a brand new, uh, network of uh, sort of fulfillment, you know, warehouses and operations. Uh, they announced it at their Shopify Unite conference this last, you know, this past year, and I think it was in June. Um, mm-hmm. And they've been slowly rolling it out. So I'd love to talk a little bit about, because at the end of the day, fulfillment is, as part of operations, is probably the, you know, one of the most important outside of probably product development. And it's an incredible headache. And it's, and there really hasn't been, I think, a ton of really easy options for earlier stage brands, right? Obviously there's Amazon out there, but outside of that, I'd love to kind of talk through kind of your methodology around, you know, did you guys start sort of shipping product, fulfilling product in house, like in your garage and then kind of, you know, move up from there. And what did you guys do prior to Shopify? And what was the trigger that caused you to switch to Shopify once they launched, you know, that program? Yeah, that's, it's, it's a great question. Cause there was a clear thought process behind it. And, uh, so, you know, long story short, you know, we started shipping out of our laundry room basically. And, you know, uh, prior to moving over to Shopify fulfillment network, which was in, I believe it was October or uh, maybe okay. it was September. Um, we were still shipping out of our, uh, you know, our office, basically, uh, you okay. got, we've got a back, back corner that's committed to fulfillment. And we had basically one employee packing orders all, all day, every day. <laughs> and so she, she was kind of maxed out at like, you know, she, she could do 200 orders a day, maybe. Um, but, you know, she was kind of maxed out at one or 150. And so, um, and which is about what we were doing kind of this summer, this fall. And, um, but we knew we were going on Shark Tank and, and we used... And we can go into this later if you want to, but we kind of use Shark Tank as this opportunity to kind of upgrade all of our processes ahead of mm-hmm. time, ahead of going on Shark Tank. And so one of the processes was like, clearly we're going to get more than a hundred orders a day after we go on Shark Tank. So what are we going to do about that? And the thought process for me was, and if anybody else is in this inflection point, like this is, this is the, this is the question you need to ask yourself. Like, do you want to be in the warehouse business or not? And, <sighs> and like, that the answer the answer to that will tell you what you need to do. And so for yeah. me, it was like, I don't want to go rent more space. I don't want to go buy shelves. I don't want yeah, like I don't want to manage employees that are shipping stuff. Like I don't want to do any. I that I do not dream about that. Um, in fact, I hate having to manage it even at our current volume, which was you know I'm talking past Patrick. Um, so it's a clear answer for me. I've got to outsource this. And like some people will come to a different. Um, answer and that's fine, but that was the answer for us. And so I had to outsource it. So I, I, you know, got quotes from everybody on the map and, you know, we, we ended up going with Shopify fulfillment network. And curious why, why Shopify, was it pure pricing or was it other sort of you know benefits of, of working with them that, that made that decision to go with them versus somebody else? Um, uh, so their pricing is good. It's as good as, if not better than, uh, everybody else that, that I, I, uh, surveyed. Um, but it was more than pricing. It was, um, I'm, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm kind of a Shopify fanboy. uh, sure. you know, cards, cards on the table. And so like, I believe that whatever they're building is, is it, it's not currently, I'll tell you that much, but it, it will eventually be the best offering on the market. So I wanted to get in on that early. They're kind of doing a beta program. They're not taking in a lot of brands. So when they called me and asked me if I wanted to be a part of it, I was like, yeah, I'm all in. So, um, so on the front end, that that was uh, really uh, why I went with it. It was pricing and, and just I believe that Shopify would build the product that would be the best on the market. Um, on the back end, though, I don't know if um, 
know, any listeners who are kind of surveying warehouses, um, I'll tell you what's been the best thing about working with them is, is um, not necessarily the Shopify portion, but, but the warehouse that they, they basically white label warehouses. They don't own any of their warehouses. They work with existing warehouses. And the one we work with down in Austin, um, I, I cannot say enough good things about those people. And, and the reason is like, they care about my business and my customers as much as I do. And like when there are mistakes, like they, they work late to make them right, or they answer phone calls on weekends to make them right. And like that, that is why I'll be loyal to them forever because, uh, because of the people that are packing my orders and, and running that warehouse. And so, um, and the reason I say that is I, I actually had been with a fulfillment network a couple of years ago that I tried and it did not go well. Things went bad and we lost a lot of money and a lot of product um, just because those people just didn't care at the end of the day about my business. So that would be my biggest tip. Like if you're given all of your products and your, your fulfillment over to somebody, you know, make sure you get a sense of whether they care about your business and your customers. So what's, what is the benefit of the Shopify fulfillment, the Shopify fulfillment network versus just going direct to that warehouse and just working directly with them? Um, I mean, the, the, the clearest benefit is the fact that the, the software lives in your Shopify dashboard and, and, Got it. and syncs, uh, uh, I won't say entirely well with your shop yet. They got a lot of bugs they got to work out, but you know, mm-hmm. the, the eventual goal is like it, it's just an app. Like I go to my app and I click yep. on Shopify fulfillment network and then it syncs with my store. And, um, you know, it's kind of one less layer to work through. And, um, but you know, beyond that, it, it's very much like a typical fulfillment warehouse, you know, they do receiving and warehousing and they ship your orders. I mean, I can see down the line how the integration of the software um, becomes an extreme benefit, even for sort of on-site conversion, right? The ability to do things like, you know, better tracking of, of yeah. your actual shipments, right? Being able to actually estimate uh, sort of shipping timelines, right? Yeah. Um, you know, things like that, very Amazon-esque style yeah. shopping experiences. The integration of those two systems makes total sense to me down the road. Obviously, it's not there yet because it hasn't, hasn't been no. built yet. So I, I get the the value to the the end consumer, meaning you know, the, the, the stores themselves, the merchants like you. Um, I'm just curious if you're, if you're seeing any of those yet or if it's, it's just sort of the fact they've done a really good job of curating who they're using in their network right now. And it's all you know, housed within your sort of existing Shopify, you know, admin ecosystem. Yeah. I'd say there's nothing super impressive at this point in terms of like those kind of advanced features, but you know, there's murmurings about kind of inventory planning and, and uh, you know, forecasting and that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know about timeline for any of that, but yeah, I'm, I'm certainly excited about if, if, and when that comes. So why not Amazon fulfillment? Did you ever look at Amazon fulfillment? Uh, them fulfilling my orders from Shopify or just in general. Cause you, you guys, I, and, and this sort of leads into the conversation talking about, talking about Amazon. Um, cause I know you guys used to sell on Amazon. Did yeah. you guys use Amazon fulfillment for your Amazon purchases? We did. Yeah. We were prime okay. when, when we were with Amazon. Okay. Okay. And so why not how, or just why not use a lot, utilize them for all of your fulfillment? Um, gosh, cause I don't trust them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fair I mean, enough. yeah, uh, I, I just do not trust them at all. I've had so many bad experiences, yeah. um, with Amazon as a, as a seller, um, you know, lost inventory, you know, can't get a straight answer from customer service. Um, you know, and, and then of course, you know, the other thing about them fulfilling your Shopify orders is that they, they don't use branded boxes and we have a lot of right. special, you know, we, we've made, you know, inserts and all that good stuff. Yeah. So gosh, I, I would not trust them with any of that. And so this, this sort of leads into the next conversation I want to have, because there's, there was a recent article in the wall street journal that featured you, you know, talking about moving away from Amazon and we're seeing a, a pretty steady migration of this, right. You know, Nike, as well as some other big name brands and also a handful of smaller brands. You guys, I think, um, I think beard brand also moved off a while ago. Yeah. What was the catalyst, the ultimate catalyst that drove you to essentially cut off an entire sales channel? And, you know, how big of a, how big of a hit did you guys take by, by, you know, removing product from Amazon? Yeah, I, I, I have really strong opinions and, and I, I want to be careful because like Amazon, you, you're not stupid if you sell on Amazon, like there right. are people making great money, building great products and brands on it. I won't say brands, but you know, 
businesses on Amazon. Um, sure. and, um, but, but it's not for us. Like it, it, as a shopper, I go to Amazon currently, I'll buy commodities, like I'll yep. buy bleach and, you know, soap or something. And I'll buy things that this is literally my thought process. Like I need something tomorrow or like I need this little tchotchke and I'm willing to take a bet on the fact that it'll break in six months, you know? <laughs> right. And like, that's, that's not, those two things are not the association I want with my brand or the, yep. the brand I'm trying to build. So, um, we were on Amazon. We, you know, early on in, in our company, we, we were doing anything we could to make a buck, right? Wholesale, Amazon, you, you, you know, our website, mm-hmm. you name it, uh, in-person, you know, trade shows and all, all the things. Um, and we sold, we sold stuff on Amazon. It, it was not, I'll tell you, it was not a huge part of our revenue at, at its peak. It was maybe 20%, uh, okay. maybe, maybe okay. 25. Um, but the, the challenge with Amazon was, um, Number one, they just pissed me off so many times. They, like I said, they they would lose. They I'll give you a perfect example. I sent them a pack, a, a case of five hundred razor blades, they, that were twenty blades per per pack. So five hundred packs of twenty blades. They received it as I don't know. I don't understand how they did this, but instead of sending a pack of twenty blades to each person who ordered a pack of twenty blades, they sent twenty packs of twenty blades to every customer. So I obviously <laughs> sold out of that case real fast, and I did all the labeling right. But they sold out of that case real fast, and then they refused to. You know, it took me months to get my money back for that inventory that they lost. That's and like, wild. You know, luckily it was just a small deal. It was a few thousand bucks I lost. But like, what if that had been like a $200,000 purchase order or something like that would have literally mm-hmm. destroyed my company. Um, so little things like that. And then there are, there are squatters and counterfeiters that, that sat on my listings. They started advertising their razors on my listings. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just such a joke, um, for me and just such a headache that it, it was not worth the money for me. Like it was not a hard decision. Um, I was like, screw it. I don't even want that money. It's too much headache. And then, and then by the way, like, it's this, it's such a game that I'm not interested in playing. I'm sure there are really smart people out there that play it very well and good on them, but the ranking game, the gray hat tactics, the reviews, yeah. I'm so tired. I was, I got so tired of playing that game. Um, that cause I was bad at it, honestly, and I didn't care to get good at it. So I took it all off and I don't know what the impact was, but I don't even care what it was to be honest. Um, we're doing we're doing just fine without Amazon. What I what I really dislike about the Amazon game, and and when I say that, it's it's referring to this idea of you know how do you manage your listings, how do you manage yeah. sort of reviews, how do you manage pricing in order to structure yourself in a way that you get presented in the top slot, right? Yep. For for search yep. terms on Amazon, right? Um, it's what I, what I really dislike about that and, and something that, and again, there's a lot of great businesses that have built massive companies off of, yeah, off of that tons strategy, of, right? Tons, tons of money, too, of money you know, yeah. eight figure brands that are, that are crushing it. It's just, it's not, def- it's not defensible, right? At yeah. some point it, at, at, at the switch, any switch that Amazon chooses to make, you've lost your moat around the business unless yeah. you're able to change the way that you do your rankings fast enough. And it, it's, it's not as defensible as just as a brand. Right. Yeah. As you know, like what you guys are building. Um, and so that's, that's always the challenge I've had with it as a sort of a primary sales channel. I totally get it as a sort of a supplementary sales channel. Yeah. Um, if there's, you know, if, if there's an opportunity out there to sell razor blades on Amazon and sort of capture a piece of the market by doing so, I, I get the concept, but it sounds like to you, the sort of the degradation of your brand, right? Sort of like the diminishing uh, way that customers look at your brand because it's on Amazon, because the way that you shop on Amazon is you think of it as a commoditized product, like that effective loan alone isn't worth the revenue that you would drive from it. No, right? no it isn't. And, and as a supplemental channel for us, it wasn't interesting because what I found, and this is specific to our product, but what I found is like, nobody's going on Amazon and searching for our product. Our product is one of those that's like, it, it's like a, Oh, I didn't know I needed that kind of product. Yep. It's not right. a worse. So, so what was happening was people would find me through my Facebook ads, you know, they go to my website and then they go try to find me on Amazon to buy it from Amazon, which I, I get that. Like I do that too. Um, but, uh, like, so I was basically 
paying twice for these customers. I was paying to send them to my website and then I was paying Amazon ads to send them to my listing and then paying Amazon. It was, I was sending my customers away from my website basically. Mm -hmm. And so when when we, when we first got off of Amazon, we would get a lot of questions of like, why aren't you on Amazon? You know, I thought you were on Amazon. And and like those have really died down only like maybe a few times a month. People will ask me if we're on Amazon, like, we don't get that question anymore. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's because people don't care or, or what, but like, we don't, we don't ever get that question anymore. So let's, let's sort of shift away from Amazon. Cause I think this is, I, I think your perspective on it is really helpful. And I think it's something that it, it, it's very easy. And again, kind of going back to the early days, right? Like when you have to make a buck, you got to make a buck, right? Especially if you're bootstrapped. Um, but I do think that it's incredibly important for brands that, or at a position where they don't need the Amazon revenue to think about, is this really going to help us in the long run? Right. And so it sounds like for you guys, the, your perspective is that it's, it's, it's not going to help you build the brand to where you want to get it. No, not for our business and, and not yep. for our product. Um, so what's next? Let's talk about, you guys have had a killer year. Let's talk about like, so a, you've moved fulfillment out of your, no, your office. You guys are on yeah. Shopify. You guys had your first seven figure year in 2018. You had your first seven figure month this past November. You were on shark tank in, was it October or November that you're on uh, shark, November, shark tank? November, November 3rd. Yeah. Right. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a killer 12 months. Right. Yeah. Right. So first off, congratulations. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about 2020. What's, what's the focus, right? And, and again, let's go back to what you said before. There is no silver bullet, right? But what are you guys looking at or where are you most interested in, in sort of placing your time and money over the next, call it, you know, 12 to 18 months where you think you guys have the, the best opportunity to, to scale further? You know, where are you focusing your efforts? Yeah, so I'm excited because we're finally it's like we, we can finally grow up a little bit. And, um, so in, encouragement to anybody who's been grinding for four years or plus, like we're only just now to a point to where like, okay, like this is how I view 2020. It's like, okay, how do we now become the business that I've always dreamed we could become? Like, whereas like prior to, you know, November previous, like we've always just kind of been just, it's like, we always felt like we were scraping by and grinding and like barely meeting payroll and just like barely getting products right. And like, we're finally at a point to where, uh, we have some, you know, some pretty good brand recognition. Um, you know, we've got a little cash in our pockets to where we can start investing in things and, and maybe hiring some help. Um, you know, give you some context. Like I've never paid myself much of a salary. My, my wife, uh, does not take a salary, you know, so, you know, we're still very much, uh, scrappy and, and grinding, but, but now I get to think about, okay, if I could design kind of my dream business, how would I design it? And so, so that involves a couple key hires. Like I mentioned earlier, we, we really need some help on the operation side of things. Um, and like, how else are we going to, how else are we going to kind of grow up? And, um, so there are some kind of, um, there, you know, we're, we're going to continue to invest in our product line and, and we're going to kind of re do a, hopefully a, a next version of the razor and the additional products we were talking about. But, you know, t- to be entirely honest with you, there's, there's not like this su- super rocket science answer to that question. It's, because uh, I get the question a lot, but but the answer is like we're going to keep doing what we're doing, but just do it a lot better. Um, so uh, all all those little levers we talked about, um, kind of in the beginning, they're going to continue to be things that I push on, just in a more professional way. So we're investing a ton in SEO. We're investing a ton in uh, conversion rate optimization. Uh, we're going to go buy. <laughs> I'm super excited about. It. We're going to go buy a ton of inventory um, because we are constantly catching up and doing yeah. back orders and out of stock. And that's such a nightmare. Um, it killed us over these past few weeks. Um, so we're going to so go you mentioned You mentioned operations. I want to touch yeah. back on that just for a second. Yeah. What, what do you feel like is like your superpower in the business, right? Is it, is it the operations and product development or is it on like the marketing and sort of strategy side? Uh, it's a little of both. I love strategy. I'm okay at marketing and I'm, I'm good enough at operations to be, to, to have gotten us this far. Um, but, uh, my, my dream, my kind of superpower is to be a CEO. Um, but right, right now I'm CEO, CFO, CMO, you know, COO. Um, and I want to get all those other O's <laughs> yeah, off my right. plate and I want to be a yeah. CEO. I love yep. strategy. I love dreaming. I love vision. And, um, I'm excited to kind of hire some people to, to, to fill the spots that I've been fake it till you make it over the past mm-hmm. few years and, and mm-hmm. be able to turn my mind 
and to like, okay, how are we really going to build a real business here? I think what's uh, the sort of the mental framework I always use with this, and this applies to anybody who's an entrepreneur, not just in sort of the physical you know, product space like you are, but it's this, the concept of, I think it's really easy for people to say, okay, well, what's your biggest lever? And now let's like go double down on it, right? Like yeah. we're going to double revenue. Let's double the thing that's working the best. Yeah. And I think there's, I think there's merit to that, that thought process. But what I find I think is even more effective and it took me a long time and, and a lot of mentors to help me understand this is if things are going well, right? Trajectory is looking good. It means things are working. Yeah. So it's kind of like thinking about like a car analogy is, you know, the, 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 the first thing you have to do to start going faster is actually taking your foot off the brake, right? right? Before you hit the accelerator. So what are the things that are actually slowing you down versus what are That's the good. things you should double down on to go faster? And so you can't really... You, know, you can't hit the accelerator until you take your foot off the brake. So like for, you know, like what are the things that you're currently doing in the business, right? And that's why I kind of asked what your superpower was. It's sort of a framework that I like to use when I assess kind of what we're doing on our side is yeah. what are the things that I'm focusing on now that I should not? Because yeah. that's essentially me put my foot on the brake when I should be focusing on other things and, and let somebody else you know, handle this thing that I'm not equipped to handle as well as somebody else, right? Yeah. So... Yeah. It sounds like you guys are thinking that way though with some of these key hires for things like operations. Yeah, we're really starting to. And it's been a big shift for us over the past month because we're kind of in this weird transition of like kind of going from a small, you know, small seven figure to thinking about what does it take to get to the eight, you know? Yep. And so I'm having to to rethink like, previously it's like been my company. I basically do everything with a little bit of help on the side. And I, when I say I, I mean Jennifer and I, the, the two yeah. founders. And and now I'm having to think like, and I honestly, I'm kind of a crappy boss, you know, to my to my employees. I don't give a lot of direction. I don't give a lot of training. <laughs> I just kind of throw them at it and go say, figure it right. out. And yeah. now I've got to turn my mind towards, it's been a real mind shift for me. Like, okay, how do I start thinking ahead to hiring and training the right people to do these things better than I can do them instead of trying to do them all myself? And And this is like the, existential challenge that I think all leaders go through, but this is the, that's the transition we're in right now. It's like, how do I think less about doing it myself and more about finding and equipping uh, people to do it even better than I could ever do it. And that's a, that's been a challenging transition for me for sure. And what do you like, what, how are you learning how to do that? You know, it's, and this is something I always like to ask, you know, other CEOs and, and founders that are, you know, earlier stage, like, you know, seven figure stages, you know, how are you figuring this out? You've never done this before, right? Your background, I think you're an engineer originally, right? Uh, yeah, before that's this, correct. Yeah. Um, how have you figured this out? Like now I know you guys have um, some investment uh, from the Shark Tank side and you obviously have advisors that come with that. But prior to that, you know, did you have an advisor network? Did you build an advisory board? Do you, know, do you pay consultants? Like what has been your sort of primary way to, to learn and figure this out as you go and more importantly, sort of speed up that learning curve? Yeah. So, um, I'll get, I'll answer the question generally first. Um, so my best resources, I sadly do not have an advisory board. I don't have a lot of mentors in my life. I, I wish I did. Um, but, um, I'll tell you what's been super valuable for me is, um, and it's, I don't know. I mean, you won't be surprised by this answer, but Twitter has been amazing for me. I've, you're you know, really active on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I love that website. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. So much of what I've learned and opportunities I've gotten have come through that website. Um, mm -hmm. And you get, you, there's this, like, there are lots of really mm -hmm. successful, smart people on there, just like opening up their brain for you to yep. kind of peek into. So like, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter and just start following people and interact with them. And surprise, a lot of them will interact with you back. So including myself, like that's, that's another thing I love to do is try to I don't know everything, but I have learned a thing or two and I, I want to try to help people as much as I can and pass on what I've learned. So Twitter has been amazing for me. I've kind of built, like I've, you know, built some friends and a little community on Twitter. And then I've got a couple of forums that I'm a part of that um, have been super helpful. Um, and then just, um, which, which forums, if you don't mind me asking. No, I don't. Uh, E-commerce fuel. Um, I'm a big okay. fan of. Yep. And then uh, Webb Smith over at 2PML, he started a forum called Polymathic um, that yep. I'm, a, I'm a part of. And then I cannot recommend enough, um, you know, reaching out to people you admire and who you think you could learn something from. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. My, my current uh, manufacturer for uh, my newest version of my razor, I found through somebody that I, that I respected called um, 
Mike Delapont. Uh, he run he started a brand called Soma. It's a water bottle. Mm-hmm. I've always yep. respected him. And I just reached out one day. I said, Hey man, I respect you, you know, and it just turned into, Hey, I got this man. Somehow I got this manufacturer contact info from him and like they are, I, I love them. Like, and it was just from a, an email I reached out and, you know, I, I did the same with Kevin Lavelle who started Mizzen in Maine and he's, mm-hmm. he's, he's, you know, been great, uh, gracious enough to give me time and give me advice and Webb Smith has given me time. And so, so the point of all of this rambling is like, reach out to people that you respect and, you know, hopefully they'll get back to you. And if they don't like, don't take it personally. I, I try to get back to as many people as I can. I don't always, but, um, you know, those have been my mentors. Like I've just kind of, I can't recommend that enough to just like try to connect with people and, and, and build a network of people that you can ask questions and, and, uh, help and rely on, uh, when the time comes. Well, this is awesome, Patrick. This has been a ton of nuggets in here. Um, and I think we'll, we'll cut it off here. I think we're gonna have to have you back probably in, you know, six or 12 months and see how things are going, but this has been incredibly helpful. So thank you for taking the time. Um, I know people are gonna get a ton of value out of this. Um, you mentioned sort of connecting. If anybody wants to connect with you or wants to find you, I know Twitter's a great place. Um, what's your Twitter, Twitter handle? Yeah, it's sounds like canoe because uh, <laughs> my last name rhymes with canoe. So uh, sounds like canoe. And then my email address is on there. Uh, you can DM me or email me. Um, and uh, if I don't answer, feel free to you know follow up and hopefully I'll get back to you sooner or later. Awesome. Well, this is fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, Patrick. Yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Hey crew, it's Alan Bird again. And real quick before you go, would you like a weekly digest of what's working today in the world of consumer facing e-commerce? Every week, our team of strategists compile a single email with growth strategies and operations tactics that help you stay ahead of the curve and ahead of the competition. Think of it as the brand operators cheat sheet. Just head over to thecommercelab.com to sign up.